there are just a lot of people reaching out to me people who say things like you know i'm i'm done with the church or i'm done with institu- i i have been done with institutionalized religion i hate how christianity has been co-opted by uh political ideologies i hate all of that stuff and so i left everything i left all of that stuff but then when i came to your stuff when i came to your content i feel like that i i may have missed certain aspects certain imaginations of of what it means to follow the way of jesus that i need to revisit because i don't think i have the full picture yet because you remind me that there's more if you if you want to call this whole chai thing what i'm doing on tiktok as a ministry it would be the ministry of helping people parse their identity especially as if you are a follower of jesus that you do not have to sacrifice your christianity that at the altar of toxic imperialistic religion Welcome back to Advent Next, a theological podcast curated for curious faith discussions. This week, we have the pleasure of talking with Kevin Wilson, a pastor at Oceanside SDA in Southern California, who may be better known as the Chai Guy. His TikTok, Cross Culture Christian, unexpectedly went from 200 to 144,000 followers in a matter of months. So today, we are exploring unique ways to incorporate our voice, our cultural heritage, and our unique perspectives and journey in the communication of the gospel, and how ministry can be as simple as sharing a cup of chai with a stranger. We want to thank the Adventist Learning Community for making this program possible. If you're not already following us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, be sure to find us at the handle at AdventNext. You can follow our guest today, Kevin Wilson, on Instagram or TikTok at CrossCultureChristian, and myself at Kendra Arsenault with the next. But right now, this is Advent Next. I know there's a lot of people who are just, I know this is true for me, that I was not sure how to incorporate the things that I love with ministry. And that's partly why I'm at the seminary, right? Like you think that if you're going to serve God, that you're just going to be a pastor or that you're going to, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being more theologically educated that never does anything, never does any harm, but... I think you've brought something, you know, beneficial to this space and to this conversation of saying there are many ways to minister and it doesn't have to look one way. So talk to us a little bit about your channel and uh, and how you got started. Yeah, so uh, the whole thing started as... uh, because I wanted to just stalk my, my young people. That's literally how this whole thing started. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I'm 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 thinking of uh, when did this happen? So February of this year, I decided to document my chai making process. In Instagram at the time, I had about you know just a little under a thousand followers, mostly just people who are friends and colleagues in ministry, and so and I, I decided to just uh, document the whole thing. And then uh, after, as an afterthought, really, I decided to just make a, a video out of it and put it on. TikTok. Now, the reason why I put it on TikTok, again, is because I wanted to, uh, I had the account mainly because I wanted to see what my youth were doing, because Mm. at the time, TikTok was creating a lot of buzz, and I decided to just put it out there and see what what happens. Nothing happened for a couple of days, but then, because of the the way TikTok, the algorithm works, it got picked up after a couple of days, and it went uh, went viral. It's the first Mm. time anything that I've done had gone on viral. And um, when I'm talking about viral, I'm talking about like literally thousands of views every single day. Wow. Um, I had to refresh with a couple of a uh, couple of hundred notifications or comments and likes, and I was just like, "Wait, what is going on?" <laughs> is and this my so, video? <laughs> right. Exactly, and so I think it started there, and I just started posting more content, and I started documenting my chai making process, and I started to explore what was working, and I think over time. I realized that chai was such, while it was such a part of, a core part of my story, my history, my culture, it also was, um, uh, it also created space for other people to explore their own stories and their own cultural backgrounds. And so that really helped me to kind of differentiate my type of content with other food creators on TikTok, where I now started to lean in more onto my story. And so I would make 
TikTok videos, obviously with the recipe and how to do this thing. So it's obviously it's obviously beneficial to people. But as uh, but the narration behind the videos are not me telling what the recipe is, but sharing a story from my life. Mm. And so that the, the that uh, that combination of things really helped me to um, kind of find my own niche and my own voice in what I'm doing. And so I've been doing that ever since. And here we are, um, wow. 145,000 people and, and, and strong. And it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty wonderful. Yeah, it's crazy. And you started, like you said, in April, you had like 200 followers, right? So this has literally happened in just a matter of months. Correct, yeah. yeah I'm like nine months or something like that. It's wild. Wow, that's great. So tell us a little bit about your story because I want to go behind the scenes. Um, and you're one of you're from one of my favorite places in the world, and so I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your story and also how that worldview and that perspective really impacts and shapes your ministry. Yeah, so I was born in Sri Lanka, the beautiful island of Sri Lanka, and I uh, lived there till I was twelve years old. And mm-hmm. I grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist uh, household. My my parents, my mom was previously Hindu. My dad was Catholic, and they met at a Seventh-day Adventist high school, sorry, college, became Adventist. So I was, my sister and I were born into an Adventist house. But it was interesting growing up in an Adventist Christian household in a predominantly Buddhist country as Sri Lanka. And from a very young age, I was... Uh, I, I I had uh, no choice but to interact with people who are different than than I mm. was, both ideologically, racially, and also uh, spiritually and religiously as well. And so I grew up there. And then when I was 12, my parents immigrated to the Middle East to a country called Oman and for, for employment purposes. And so when they moved, they took myself and my sister along with them. So I finished my elementary school in Sri Lanka and I did my high school and I graduated high school in, in Oman. And even there in Oman, it was interesting because Oman is a predominantly Muslim country, mm. you know, but that's the, <clears throat> that's the uh, religion there. And I so I met a lot of Muslim friends. Uh, I was probably myself, my sister and another person was, we were the only Adventist in the school of like 800 students. Wow. And um, yeah, so uh, that's, and then when I was 18 years old, I came to the States on a green card. <laughs> and so, yeah, the la- last couple of, last few decade, decades of my life have just been marked by a lot of, a lot of un- I- itinerant, you know, travels, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different encounters and, and uh, interactions, which just kind of shaped, I think, the way I think about life and theology and ministry and other people's stories. And it's so interesting. So I I talked to you about this before. I was in Sri Lanka about four years ago, four or five years ago, I can't remember, and was there for a month. And they had a civil war, um, you know, not too long ago. And there's a lot of cultural tensions within that climate. And it's something that you experienced yourself. And I think that, you know, you are in a unique place where you are really relating to kind of the things that are happening here in America culturally and those cultural tensions. So if you could, like, And if you don't mind sharing a little bit about that, because I think, you know, it's interesting to see how these issues of race and class and discrimination uh, really touch upon people all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So, no, that's a great question. In Sri Lanka, you have a few different ethnic groups. There are two majority groups in Sri Lanka. You have the, uh, the Sinhalese. Mm-hmm. who are mostly Buddhist in terms of their religious uh, affiliation. And then you have the Tamils. And the Tamils, most of them are Hindus. Some of them are Christians. The Tamil population is kind of the the minority group in Sri Lanka. And then under the Tamil group, you have the other other small minority groups uh, called the, the, the burghers, not to be confused with what you, what you eat, but these are descendants from the Dutch, uh, port, the, uh, uh, when they colonized Sri Lanka, and so you know, a lot of because of a lot of intermarriage and racial relationships, you have a small group of people who look nothing like like me, in Sri Lanka. So, but uh, I think ever since Sri Lanka got independence from the British rule, while Sri Lanka was attempting to unite together as a, a nation, and I we we don't have time to get into the history. One of the things that happened was this. 
the the um what do you say the exacerbation of this prejudice between the singhalese uh, majority and then the tamils and so because of buddhist nationalism that happened even before the 80s um, the tamil major- the tamil minority in sri lanka didn't, they didn't feel like they had a voice or or that their voice was uh, was not considered as mm-hmm. as part of uh, you know when it, when it comes to the, how how we how we run this country so to make the long story longer <laughs> um there was a civil war that happened in the early that, that started in the early 80s because there was a group of tamil militants who decided hey you know what uh we want to we we want our own portion of the land the civil war went on for a couple of years it was very very bloody very brutal so many casualties so much destruction the civil war is over now in sri lanka however the remnants of discrimination and the remnants of racism still still linger and uh, you know for me as a tamil so i'm i'm part of the the tamil minority group and so i remember when i went to sri lanka i was i actually went to a i think I, you know not i think it was it was kind of a segregated school um uh, you know in 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 sri lanka you in uh, most of the public schools and i'm not really sure as to how they are do, how they are right now but when i went to school for each grade so grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 each grade you had about six or seven different classes for singhalese students or come from singhalese ancestry and then you had one class for tamil students mm. and so or one grade and so i remember growing up with with in a class where all of us were tamil speaking students and i remember having a uh, little skirmishes or fights during recess between the singhalese students and the tamil students mm. and uh, i don't want to paint this as as being like all those guys were racist or what not now we had a really good time the brotherhood was strong but i would be lying if i were to tell you that uh, myself and my family did not experience prejudice or some racial ten- tensions or stereotype st- stereotyping from mm. from the majority group or some members from the majority group growing up and so coming here to the states you know we are in this interesting cultural moment um where we are sensitized to the, the to the, the differences between people and the the racial disparities that the country is facing you know especially uh, for people of color and so i feel like i i can relate to it in a lot of ways and i can relate to the caste system i can there's so many similarities between what we experience in sri lanka and how uh, uh many people of color are being mistreated or unfairly treated here in this country so mm. yeah i mean we can keep talking about this but no for sure yeah um, there's no, a lot, and there's a lot of overlap i i i completely agree in fact i was i was in jaffna and that's where like a lot of some brutal fighting happened you can still see the bullet holes in the wall it's in the northern part of sri lanka and it's Correct. just like it's it is just the remnants of kind of you know what happens like you're saying when an oppressed class is fighting for a voice and there's a dominant party that's not allowing that to happen and and there's so many parallels to what's happening right now in our own country and our, and in, even in the microcosms of our own life and so i really appreciate that perspective that you bring to this no thank you so no, Well, and another thing too, and I know this is a, this is a story that I found on your TikTok, uh, is the story of of your father working um, in the tea plantations, and uh, we talked a little bit about this before, but it's it's just so interesting to for me to see, you know, like just this progression of your life. Like now you're here and you have this huge following, but you came from very very humble beginnings. Yeah. No. So. So that's actually my grandfather in that video okay. that you're referring to and uh, my grandfather was a tea plantation worker during the British the British uh, rule Good. and uh, and so he was not just a tea plantation worker he was really really good at what he did and so he became a kanakapale so basically it's somebody who uh he's kind of like a supervisor of uh what happened in the in the tea estates because of his work ethic because of his command of english and he's just a very bright uh and a influential man So yeah, uh he grew up in the uh he he worked in the tea plantations. My dad grew up in um in 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 Hatton in 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 the up country of Sri Lanka and they my parents actually both of them they faced a lot of poverty. I mean, they went through just a lot and their story is inspiring for sure, you know, like uh, uh where sometimes when I feel like I uh, 
there are many times where I look back at their parents and I'm like, wow, you know, you you guys have in many ways just paved the way for myself and my sister to to be here. Mm. And so, yeah, uh, there's just a lot of similarities between that and my experience here too. Um, and I came here when I was 18, trying to figure out stuff by myself. And yeah, no, mm. it's great. I'm just really grateful for God um, for how he has, uh, he's really paved the way for us. So how did you get into ministry? I mean, because before you, you, you started the, I mean, the whole, the whole like uh, catalyst for you even starting the TikTok channel is that you are a uh, youth pastor. So how did you even get interested into ministry? Was that always a strong calling of yours? So I never wanted to be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually had no interest whatsoever growing up. There was one there was one aspiration. There was, there was only one thing, and I wanted as much as possible to work towards that goal, and it was to be a pilot. Um, I, Interesting. I always, That's very different. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. I remember the first time I got into a plane when I was 13 years old, and I was just hooked. I said, oh, wow, I want to do this. And so ever since that point, I always want to be a pilot. But I was also quite active at church. Um, I... I, I I, I did the I did the Sabbath school thing. I grew up in uh, very active in adventurers and not so much pathfinders. We didn't have pathfinders uh, mm. growing up, and so but like I was really active. I preached quite a bit. Um, I enjoyed communicating up front at church, and so when I moved to the states when I was eighteen, I I had one goal. I wanted to be a pilot, and so I applied to all the flight schools that I could find in the area, which was in Maryland. I was in Maryland. And to make the long story short, I did not get into any one of them, either because of my like really bad grades in high school, um, or and or my uh, my lack of finances. I mm. didn't have money to fund that education. So out of sheer desperation, I talked to God and I said, God, I literally I don't know I don't know what I want to do, uh, but you know what? I'll make a deal with you. I'll be a pastor. Now, why I'm a pastor? Why? Why I said that was, I was looking back in my life and I was trying to figure out what I was good at, mm. and I was good at speaking. Ergo, I decided to make that connection. I said, okay, I want to be a pastor, God, and I'll be a pastor for you, uh, if you can actually get help me get into Andrews University. Now, why Andrews University it was because at the time in 2008, I thought that as a new fr- fresh person. In, 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 in the States, I thought that Andrews University was the only Adventist institution in the entire country. <laughs> and, part, <laughs> and, it's because of, and it's because of 3ABN. If you're, if you're Adventist and you listen to this, you know about 3ABN, Three Angels Broadcasting Network. It's kind of like this Adventist uh, ne- uh, broadcasting you know, television network that broadcasts Adventist programming to pretty much the entire world. And I remember every week Growing up, one of my experiences was as a little kid, I uh, st- snuggle up with my parents right after church on Sabbath to watch Pastor Dwight preach at the Pioneer Memorial Church. And yeah. so I, I kept telling myself, you know what, it'll be really cool to go to America one day and get a get an autograph from Pastor Dwight. I think that my, <laughs> then after that, my life will be made. Well, <laughs> again, long story short, I got into Andrews, got paid my way through school. And ever since I got into Andrews, it just the calling kind of grew. To a point where I just realized, yeah, I start. I may have started doing this because I had no choice, but now I'm choosing to do this because I do see uh, that there are very few things that are as important as yeah. as communicating the uh, a way of be- becoming human in the way of Jesus. If not, that's probably one. It's probably the top of the list, to be honest with you. Um, so I decided, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably do this, and um, so that's what happened. Wow. Wow. I love this story. I feel so warm inside. I'm thinking of <laughs> little Kevin just watching the TV <laughs> uh, with big dreams ahead of him. And, and God had so many bigger plans for you as well. That, that's awesome. Yeah, it was really cool to like uh, go to Andrews and then actually talk to Pastor Dwight and actually tell that to him. And mm-hmm. then again, and I got to work with him you know, on a couple of projects. And I was just like, yo, I you have no idea. I thought you're like, like <laughs> the the biggest things in sliced, sliced bread, you know. <laughs> but here I am, the like Michael Jackson of Adventist. Well, yeah, never mind. The, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's not a, a very good illustration point. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so, but it yeah. sounds like you've been, uh, you know, traveling a lot, and it seems like we talked a little bit about this, you know, about 
just the feeling of what it's like to be an outsider, right? Like uh, you moving from Sri Lanka to Oman and then from there to the States. And it seems like, one, you've been through a lot of transitions. And even in your own, you know, where you were born in Sri Lanka, it felt like you were an outsider. How have you used this kind of feeling of feeling like, I don't know if I belong anywhere or I don't know exactly where to make my mark. How have you used that to, as a, instead of seeing it as a liability, how has it become an asset for you in your ministry? Yeah, that's such a great question. For me, I think in the last few years, um, God had to remind me that my story with its ups and downs, with its trauma and its uh, delights is the location for the transformation of Kevin Wilson. Hmm. You know, that's that's where he's going to do his best work. And God also had to remind me that that he was, a, you know, a master alchemist, you know, who was able to identify and, and, and extrapolate things like pain and suffering and difficulty and brokenness from my story and then convert it and transform it into precious things in the lives of other people. Mm. And um, so, yeah, you know, God, I, for the longest time, I thought the fact that I didn't fit in, the fact that I had an accent, the fact that I looked different than most of my colleagues at Andrews as in the, in the theology department, I saw all of that as as impediments, as things that just prevent me from just uh, being accepted by, by everybody else. And so I tried my best to just conform. You know, I want to... Uh, I, because of be, one of the things that 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 I've kind of I'm almost intuitive as at is is adapting like like a chameleon like a cultural chameleon wherever you are just quickly just adjust conform so that you don't have to explain yourself but God had to now and I, and I did that for such a long time and God had to remind me listen your story is is not something that um uh that you have to explain away. Uh, mm. Your uniqueness is not something that you have to explain away. Your particularities is not something that you have to explain away, but it's something that uh, that I can bless and that I will bless for other people. Mm. Yeah. I love that because I think, you know, when I look at myself, I, I definitely feel a, a similar way, you know, being of mixed ethnic origin, moving around a lot. And even just, because even in my own family, not having... Uh, being the only Adventist in my family, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself to just fit in, right? Like you don't want to make too many waves. You don't want to even excel in some ways. I think sometimes people have a a fear of excelling because it'll make them stand out. Uh, But I think the call of the gospel is to stand out, is to be uniquely you. And so what is that unique voice that you'd say that God is bringing you into? And what are you saying from that voice? Wow. Yeah, no, that's, and see, you, that, that <laughs> question, I think people should definitely hear that question, and it should, it, it should be a question that every single person who is an apprentice of Jesus, someone who follows the way of Jesus, has to wrestle with, and that's something that I'm wrestling with right now, and I, clearly, I don't, I don't think I have, like, the answer yet, but let me share with you an in- interaction that I had, like, a couple of weeks ago, that is kind of, uh, not forcing me, but encouraging me to dig deeper into us answering that question for myself. Mm. Uh, two weeks ago, actually not two weeks ago, like a month ago, I was approached by the Southeast Asian director for InterVarsity. So basically, this is like a, a public campus ministry uh, that that's that's been uh, that's that's been there for such a long time. Their mission is to help uh, uh, disciple. Uh, p- college students into the way of Jesus in the public campuses uh, of the country. So this is thing, this thing has grown so much to the point where they've, they've had to have like different chapters for it. And so this guy is an Indian Christian man who is also my age, who's leading the Southeast Asian chapter of it. And so he found me on TikTok and he was shocked that I was a pastor. And so mm. he reached out to me and he said, can you please, uh, can, can we figure out a way, can you please talk to, uh, our student leaders, who are mostly, if not all of them, are Desi. So these are Indians, Sri Lankans, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, you know, that part of the world. These are people mm-hmm. who are Christian. Can you please talk to them and help, and in order to help them uh, realize 
that they do not have to sacrifice their uniqueness and their cultural identity at the altar of Christianity. Yes. And I was, when he told me that, and I was just like, whoa. Mm. Like, it was just kind of, my mind went into like a million places because, uh, because, because that's the thing that a lot of people from my part of the world, they struggle with. Because there's this understanding that if you are Christian in that part of the world, you're somehow uh, a less of an Indian or less of a Sri Lankan or less of a Pakistani because you have adopted the religion of the colonizer. The oppressor. Mm -hmm. The oppressor. And so, so you have the entire generations of kids growing up in their Christian household and now when they interact with their Buddhists or their Hindu or their Muslim friends, they feel out of place. They feel like they, they kind of have to kind of just make, make their identities obtuse so that you know, they won't rough up any feathers, you know, they don't talk about Christianity, they don't talk about all these different things, because they're like, I don't know, I don't know if, so, uh, I think, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what my voice is, but I definitely think that a part of it is, a part of the calling that God has given me, at this point in my life at least, is to help people make that, make that distinction, and to, and to help people especially people from my part of the world, you know, the, who have the immigrant experience, who are not part of the dominant uh, cultural groups in the countries that, they are, that they're part of, to help them distinguish between, on the one hand, their cultural identity, and on the other hand, uh, institutionalized religion, but yeah. also, on the other hand, the raw, unadulterated way of Jesus. So... Yeah. So that that's something that I'm thinking about and thinking through right now. So that is so powerful. And, and I just want to I, I hope people are connecting with this because that's something that we're even dealing with, you know, in the States, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, the African-American ad adaptation of Christianity and, and an adoption of Christianity. Like, why would someone adopt the religion of their enslavers? Right. Mm -hmm. And we did a. a a podcast with this with uh, Dr. Oregio a few months back, looking at the African origins of Christianity and just trying to get people like, to have a sense of an identity and ownership of the Christian faith outside of this particular context so that people can say that they have history in it uh, in a way that's not so new. It's, it's not strictly from a colonizer or an oppressor perspective, but what you're saying about looking at the difference between institutional religion culture and then just the personal walk with Jesus. I think that, that 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 last piece is exactly what, you know, is the testimony. Because why would I follow Jesus if it wasn't for the fact that he is something very real to me, right? Because uh, every other rational reason says this doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. No, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And, and, you have so many people and what who are asking those questions. You know, my DMs are, uh, I won't say flooded. That's that sounds pretentious, but there are just a lot of people reaching out to me. People who say things like, you know, I'm I'm done with the church or I'm mm -hmm. done with I I have been done with institutionalized religion. I hate how Christianity has been co-opted by. Uh, political ideologies. I hate all of that stuff. And so I left everything. I left all of that stuff. But then when I came to your stuff, when I came to your content, I feel like uh, that I, I may have missed certain aspects, certain imaginations of of what it means to follow the way of Jesus that I need to revisit because I don't think I have the full picture yet because you remind me that there's more. I'm really humbled by all of these things. I'm really humbled by that. And so that's kind of, if you if you want to call this whole chai thing, what I'm doing on TikTok as a ministry, which I'm kind of hesitant to call it, um, uh, and we can get into it later on if you want to, but if you call it a ministry, if it would be the ministry of helping people parse their identity. You know, mm. it, it, it means, it, it would be, oh, the chai is nothing more than a symbol, um, a cup, you know, through through which uh, we uh, through which we can uh, in the in the place of uh, shared stories. Now we can now have these conversations and help people realize that uh, that their perspectives are so valid. And especially as if you are a follower of Jesus, that you do not have to sacrifice 
your Christianity, that you do not have to sacrifice your uh, faith at the altar of, um, of, of, of toxic imperialistic religion. And Christianity, yes. and so yeah, so I, I I come alive when I help people do that as to to the best of my abilities. Well, I love this. I love this, and I'm going to challenge you. So why don't you think your TikTok is a ministry? Because it's obviously reaching people and helping them to reconnect with the faith that they've long lost. Yeah, you know. Okay, I'm beginning to see it as a ministry. To in all fairness, I'm beginning to see it. Uh, but I think for the for the for the longest time, one of the reasons as to why I didn't call it my ministry is because of conflating ministry with evangelism. Mm. Um, so, like for me, my defi- I, I, you know, I I I think evangelism is a specific aspect of ministry where you are inviting some people or, or groups of people or one person to uh, to follow the way of Jesus and to consider following the way of Jesus, either through a seminar, through a series of talks, or whatnot. You know, I see that as evangelism. And that's just a very broad definition of it. Mm. Uh, ministry, I see ministry uh, as just uh, people serving one another out of the gifts that God has given them uh, to the betterment of, uh, of the community and the individuals around, around them. So I, I see that, I see that as, as ministry. And so evangelism is a part of ministry, but not all ministry is evangelistic. I don't know if that mm-hmm. makes any sense. Yes. So I think for the longest time when people said, oh, you're doing this for ministry, I kind of shied away at it because I was like, no, I'm not converting people. Like this is not, that's not the point. Yeah. But the story that I told myself was like, wait, now I'm realizing this, I, 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 that, yeah, because you thought, Kevin, that this is you're doing this to convert people. But now, recently, as of recently, like I, I've been revisiting all of that stuff, and and uh, I've been going through my own journey of actually owning this thing as uh, a potential ministry. You know, uh, uh, as, as something that like is really helping people um, uh, clarify yeah. you know their pursuits and stuff. So yeah, that's the sh- that's kind of the long answer to your question about ministry or not. Please stay tuned for next week as we continue our conversation with Kevin Wilson, also known as the Chai Guy. Join us as he gives some timely advice on what digital ministry looks like today and how to move in the space of social media with intention and integrity. I hope this conversation has inspired you to do ministry in a new way, incorporating all the gifts that God has given you. If you're not already following us on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, be sure to do so at Advent Next. You can also follow our guest, Kevin Wilson, at Cross Culture Christian on Instagram or TikTok, and follow me at Kendra Arsenal with an X. So, what subjects would you like me to cover next? Subscribe and leave a comment below, and see you next week. <laughs>